Welcome to episode three of Photo Geek Weekly, recorded on November 20th, 2017. Uh, I'm your host, Don Kamarechka, and I am joined with a guest co-host for the first time, uh, Mike Howard, who is no stranger to podcasting and being in the conversational seat, and an old-time friend of mine. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great, Don. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, this is going to be fun. This is a, a, a you saw the show notes. You know how geeky yep. this is going to get. Um, but these conversations, I think, need to be had outside of the realm of the standard podcast uh, conversations about the the latest and greatest camera gear or what's the newest app for the iPhone. There's a lot of that that's already being covered. Um, so today we're going to talk about some rumblings in the medium format world, which you're going to care about sooner or later. And there's some very important reasons why uh, that this stuff is on the horizon. Uh, a little aside on to some copyright issues, this one involving a rock star who I'm a fan of uh, for at least three reasons. Um, and there's a bit of back and forth uh, for discussion and opinions, though neither of us are lawyers. Um, and then finally, we're going to be talking about some patents that have come up from Canon. Uh, and one of these is rather innovative, and the other one is way, way too late. And I'm curious why it's taken them so long to get there. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in. Uh, medium format rumblings. These uh, these uh, news stories have been coming up more and more frequently lately, I think. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that, because uh, Sony has put out its roadmap for new sensors, the sensors that are used in most of the medium format cameras out there. We're talking uh, Hasselblad, Pentax, even the Phase 1 cameras. And for the smaller sensor ones, the mirrorless Fuji and, and Hasselblad, as well as the Pentax, they're all using a variation on the same camera sensor. and Word is, in the 2018 year, Sony will be releasing an updated version of that that not only doubles the resolution from uh, 50 megapixels to 100 megapixels, but it also, uh, the, the article that I was reading says that it doubles the throughput, but it, it doubles the frames per second, which is far more than doubling the throughput if you're already at double resolution and double the frame rate. And so six frames per second at 100 megapixels on what will be the next product from these guys, because this sensor will be available for them to roll into their next machine. Um, so if you see the, the Hasselblad X1D, and it might not be perfect because there's some issues being a first model and the same thing for the Fuji, Pentax is already on their second. Um, where do you think this is going, Mike? Is this interesting for the <laughs> professional photographer? Oh, uh, that is insane. It's 100 megapixel at six frames per second is just, you know, unheard of even today that you can do something like that. Me personally, I, you know, I have to find out the price on these things, whether I'd be interested in them. Um, but as I get more and more in the landscape, as my kids get older and I'm not doing sports as much and I'm doing more landscape, you know, I, I might be interested in them if the price is reasonable, but um, I'm not sure where that price is going to be. But even, even if those things are way outside of my budget, you know, what you end up having on the top end is top end products break barriers. It also helps lower end products. And we all get the benefit from those barriers being broken. Exactly. And uh, I mean, how often do you see when a new camera comes out, the old one gets uh, uh, drastically reduced in price um, or the used market will explode because there's a lot of people that go to the next big thing and uh, they don't need their old camera anymore. Mm -hmm. So. These cameras are priced in and around the eight to $9,000 range. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, if you're going to go for a Nikon D5, a Canon mm -hmm. 1DX Mark II, I mean, you're right below that, that price threshold. And I'm not saying that that would be the camera that you'd be looking at. Um, but the professionals out there that need certain features are willing to pay for them at a certain price point. But the interesting thing is, this price of eight or $9,000 is ridiculously low compared to what it was even five years ago, when to get into a medium format camera system, you would be looking at the price of a luxury automobile. Uh, and now you can get in under 10 grand for a camera and a lens, albeit with the Hasselblad and the, uh, the Fuji, the lens uh, selection is not completely there yet because they are new formats. But uh, the Pentax, uh, which is not a mirrorless camera, but it's still absolutely fantastic, uses the same sensors. And uh, I love what those cameras can produce. I, a, a colleague of mine has the uh, Pentax 645Z. Uh, it's Z up here in Canada. And it's, uh, it is a beast to hold. It is the sturdiest rock solid camera that I've ever held. Uh, but people looking for a mirrorless camera, this is the exact opposite of what they want. 
interestingly enough, with the uh, the upcoming sensors for the phase one medium format cameras, uh, which a lot of people don't realize this, there's two sensor size formats in the medium format uh, digital world, sort of like there are uh, for SLRs, the APS-C, which is a smaller size, and then the full frame sensor uh, beyond that. So the, um, the Hasselblad, Pentax, and Fuji all use a 44 millimeter by 33 millimeter sensor. But the phase one uses a 55 millimeter by 41 millimeter sensor, uh, if memory serves correctly. So it is much closer uh, to the traditional medium format size thinking of film. And Sony's going to be rolling out a 150 megapixel sensor at that size. And uh, I mean, the specs are very, very similar across the board. The pixel pitch um, and the, the actual pixel size uh, is the same between these two sensors. So it's just, it's the same, but just more space, more area, and thereby you've got higher megapixels as a result. So this is interesting because as these cameras become more and more viable at a price that is far lower than, uh, than it has been historically, got a lot of attention from professional photographers, especially like you said, on the landscape side where the fastest autofocus, the fastest rate of speed being 30 frames per second or whatever it is, that's not as meaningful to you as it is for others. Mm -hmm. So then how do you test this? How do you get out of your comfort zone? Well, Hasselblad also announced that it is starting this program called Rent a Hasselblad. And uh, this is sort of a promotional initiative. They're probably going to lose money on it in the long term, but it will get Hasselblad cameras into the hands of people far faster uh, than a regular rental price would be. So for the, uh, the the body and I think the 90 millimeter lens, the total cost to rent it for a day would be $135. Now, Mike, if you've got a great day trip planned, is that, that something that you'd be willing to do? Yeah, that's very reasonable. And you know, if I'm if I'm go looking to go that high, a Nikon D5, I'm a Nikon guy, a Nikon D5 is what, six, $7,000? Yeah, I'm not that far away from one of these cameras at that price range anyway. You know, I was thinking you were gonna tell me these were $30,000, but at that price range, you're not that far off. It's a little more than what you were gonna spend, but being able to rent them for a day or for a week, you can you can decide from that. Hey, am I willing to spend an extra two, three thousand dollars on these things um, to, to go there? So I think that's a great idea. And especially if you look at the week long rentals, you're saving many hundreds of dollars when you uh, sort of rent through this Hasselblad program compared to the people that were previously renting these cameras to begin with, because they want them in people's hands. That is the barrier here that they have to overcome. A lot of people just enjoy what they have, the status quo, and they look for the next new camera in the same format or that can use the same lenses. And jumping ship, especially to something as foreign as medium format, is not on people's radar. So they're working really hard to get it there. And they should be, because if you look at some of the uh, the tests for these sensors, uh, DxO just recently published their, um, uh, their full uh, ranking of the Pentax 645Z, uh, even though they had been working on it for two years, didn't necessarily publish it properly, those numbers came in as one of the highest ranked cameras ever tested. Um, and if they're saying that medium format is gonna double their resolution, double their frame rate within the next product cycle, yeah, this, this is the, the place to be looking. If you are the pixel peeper that wants the absolute best out of their images and is willing to pay a small percentage more than the flagship body from Canon or Nikon or Sony. I mean, this is where you're looking at that point. And that shakes up this industry quite seriously, I think. Yeah, so we mentioned landscapers. Who else do you think would be in the market for, for something like that? Fashion photographers, absolutely. Uh, product photographers, uh, artwork reproduction photographers. Um, anything that doesn't require a, uh, a a huge frame rate. And so for me, I, I did a lot of work with the 5D Mark II uh, when it first came out, and it was only 3.9 frames per second. The current medium formats are around three frames per second. So kind of in the same ballpark, but it was not an easy task. And I was very happy when I could up that uh, when I upgraded to a, a 1D series body. But I didn't have to. I could have gone to uh, another camera in the same class, uh, a 7D or something else, and I could have gotten that. But I went for the big guns because that would have given me some initiative um, to say, okay, well, what else can I do with the camera? You know, I've got much more um, ISO flexibility for low light photography, and I explored astrophotography quite seriously. Mm -hmm. um, these cameras do perform decently in low light, not as good as some of the, uh, the 35 millimeter stuff, but um, it's gonna get there, and it's gonna come across us 
like just like a wave, like a tsunami that we don't expect. Um, so that's there. I'm putting it out there. Everybody keep your eye on this medium format stuff because it is going to evolve and it's going to evolve quite quickly. So um, the next uh, kind of slightly related topic to this is um, Nikon has just sent up into space five of their D5 uh, SLRs. And uh, they're now uh, floating around in the International Space Station. So it's really fun to see where these cameras go and why they have to go there. Uh, Mike, did you read the story? I, I did not read it very much, no. <laughs> but I was very interested in this story because as a Nikon guy, you know, now we got Nikon D5s up in the space station. That is just sounds super cool. I know that they had uh, previous uh, flagship cameras up there. I can't remember if it was the D3S or the D4s. Um, but uh, now they've got the flagships. And the reason why is not because they needed the capabilities of that camera, to my knowledge. It's because these cameras in space decay very, very quickly. Gamma radiation, of all mm -hmm. things, uh, in space will cause the sensor to fail very quickly. And when you might see a hot pixel on your camera, uh, a red dot or a white dot or whatever color it happens to be, um, those creep in very, very quickly when you have a camera in space because there's no atmosphere to protect you um, from the cosmic radiation. So Nikon has five new cameras up there. And it's well documented how hard uh, these uh, uh, these cosmic rays are on camera sensors. There was a, uh, a an IMAX documentary film that was shot up on the International Space Station, or at least a portion of it was, and they were using Canon cameras, a, a C500 and a 1DC for their cinema stuff. And uh, they had to replace those at least once over their 11-month uh, shoot. So uh, stick a camera in, a uh, in space for a year and it will all already start to fall apart to the point where, you know, for production work, it's no longer usable. Now, there's a little hidden um, rumor. I don't know if there's any truth to substan uh, substantiate this, but um, camera manufacturers often ship their cameras by sea rather than by plane. And the further up you are in the atmosphere, the more access uh, your camera gear has to these deadly cosmic rays. So there, there is some truth to that, although I haven't actually wow. seen it myself. I don't, I don't do a whole lot of flying, um, but uh, somebody that is actively flying all over the place might be able to attest to this. Maybe I should uh, reach out and, and get a, another opinion on that. Now, do you think they, sh they ship the flagship uh, camera up there? for publicity versus sending you know a lower end camera um that would be cheaper but might last just as long i mean if you're if it's getting the bombarded cost of by getting the camera to the international space station far outweighs the cost of cameras that's true that's yeah. true uh, I, I think that's really what it boils down to but interestingly uh, uh nikon is is going to win this for the long run i mean nikon has, uh, uh, I don't know how many lenses out there, but NASA has all of these special wrapped housings to take those cameras outside. NASA's not going to reinvent things uh, and use a, uh, a mirrorless camera, even though they started with Hasselblad's way back with the moon stuff. It's, it's, Nikon has a foothold there, but I don't think that's going to keep them afloat unless they, they stay <laughs> innovative in their ways. That's not a big enough market. I don't think so. I don't think so. But hey, there, there's five of them. And there, there's a sale for you, Nikon. Yeah. Uh, so all right. Don't so don't pick those up used, you're saying. When I, yeah, when well, <laughs> but hey, you know what? If you've got one of those cameras that was in space, just for that very virtue, it's probably worth more than any other Nikon camera on the planet. And you can get the sensor replaced. Okay. So... Um, Keep in mind that uh, replacing a sensor in a camera is probably going to be around a thousand to a fifteen hundred dollar uh, charge on one of those flagship bodies. So not exactly a cheap uh, a cheap fix. Right. Right. All right. Story number two that I want to talk about today um, is uh, interesting and frustrating at the same time. So rock legend Brian May, uh, famous being the, the lead guitarist of Queen, um, he's been slamming a photographer for protecting her copyright. And this is a, um, I, I found this on Petapixel, but it's been widespread since then. And uh, this is a very interesting scenario because uh, Brian May, I should say Dr. Brian May, because he has a PhD in astrophysics as well as being a rock star. Um, and he's also a notable uh, supporter of stereoscopic photography. Um, he's made 3D viewers and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and he's done a lot of stereo work for Queen as well. Uh, but anyhow, 
Back to the problem at hand. Um, he took a photo from uh, a, a photographer, and we don't know any of the details yet for uh, like if this person had a contract or what uh, what the scenario was. But uh, used it without giving credit and presumably without permission, because when the photographer found the image being used, um, they say they tried to get in touch with uh, with Brian May, but uh, celebrities are sometimes difficult to get a hold of. Right. Uh, and when that didn't work, just contacted Instagram to say this was a copyright infringement issue. Instagram disabled his account and uh, he had to deal with it for you know less than an hour or so to get things reactivated and then posted a scathing comment about this photographer, even mentioning so far as uh, if he ever saw her at a concert again, he would likely have her thrown out. Um, read that one, yep. Yeah, what are your thoughts on this, Mike? So I always hate when one artist, Brian May, who's an, you know, an artist, is you know uh, violating the copyrights of another artist and then complaining about it when the photographer said something about it. I mean, if the photographer was stealing the the music of Brian, I'm sure he would not like that. And it's it's really the same thing as if she had stole. I think it was a female photographer, if I remember right. Um, yep. Yeah, if if she had stole his music, I'm sure he would have had comments on that too. So, well, here's yeah. one of the problems with photography, though, is because if you steal a Queen song uh, and you're listening to that, you are appreciating that as a song that has been produced by Queen. Right. If you steal a photograph, and it's not uh, there's no byline or there's no way of knowing who took that photograph. Uh, it becomes something 100% anonymous at that point. No credit, um, even in a feel-good way, ever goes back to the artist because the artist will never be known in that right. sense. Now, it's it's still bad, but stealing photographs, I think, is worse for the artist than stealing music. Uh, there might be some backlash commentary on that, but I stand my ground on that because people <laughs> steal my work all the time. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny. I was, I was teaching at a high school uh, recently. I was a guest speaker in there. And uh, I, I walked in and I was setting things up and I noticed one of my images was on the wall, infringed on four times. Wow. In, in a high school that I had never been to with people that I've never met. So copyright infringement is a serious issue. It but is. how do you deal with it? Um, in this case, the photo wasn't credited, but maybe it didn't have to be. We don't know if there was a contract signed. If this photographer was an official photographer that signed away certain rights on a contract uh, that then uh, Dr. May would have in order to, uh, to to do whatever he would want with. And maybe the, the contract states that the photographer's name would have to be present. And um, uh, Brian May said that you know he usually credits the name of the person. But just crediting the name of a person alone is not good enough unless there's a contract backing it up. Uh, I mean, if if he took that, if I took that picture and was asked by the performer to use it, I would say yes, absolutely. But if it was taken without asking, that just leaves me in a really sore spot. Uh, just yeah. it's like a punch to the gut. He did like he did try and claim that since you you took a photo of me and then you use my image to promote yourself. Um, in whatever way he, he was doing it. So he was trying to say, that's an image of me and you can't use it, if I remember the article. Well, th this is tricky because if you're walking down the street in some tourist attraction and some family uh, comes up to you and says, hey, can you can you take our picture? Um, and you say, yeah, sure, of course. And you take that picture and then they go off and they do whatever they want with it. You own that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you would be the jerk of the year for enforcing your copyright on that photograph. Uh, it's implied that you kind of hand it over when you hand over the camera. Um, so there's a lot of gray area uh, in this sort of stuff. When you're photographing yeah. a person, and that person in this case, I mean, it's a public venue in the sense that anybody could buy tickets, right? It wasn't private. It wasn't exclusive in any way. Uh, and there is no expectation of privacy of this individual. Uh, clearly not. He's rocking on stage. So in that sense, he falls into some random person that you would photograph walking on the street. And how many street photographers sell prints of random people on the street? It happens all the time. That's allowed uh, by the, the copyright acts in a variety of different countries. Now, keep in mind, Mike, you're not a lawyer, and neither am I. No, so no, uh, we're kind of talking out of our butts a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've actually had it happen to me a little bit. I know with as much work as you do, as much good, great work as you put out there, it, it's probably happening all the time to you. And I feel for those artists that 
are constantly being ripped off and stolen from. I found one of mine hanging in Walmart. Oh, <laughs> um, so I, I found some of mine on Walmart's website, um, yeah. and I've got some copyright cases going on where people have productized it into, uh, you know, consumer devices uh, and decals and things like that. It's yeah, uh, it's I've, I. Mm. I feel that the, the, the photographer here, the, I think she said she tried to reach out to him, but you're right, getting a hold of an artist. I mean, a, somebody of Brian May's status is going to be hard. So she took the next step. That The only thing left to her was to contact Instagram and, and do something there. I've sent out a ton of, uh, of copyright infringement or DMC takedown notices, whatever you want to call them, uh, to Facebook and Flickr and Twitter for a variety of different reasons. Um, interestingly enough, we don't have a Digital Millennium Copyright Act here in Canada, but they still all respect the forms if a Canadian fills them out. So I just go and, and, and put in the request and it comes down. I've had some people be belligerent uh, when I've asked them personally, say, hey, by the way, could you please take that down? Some people just don't say anything and they do it. Okay, that's a bit of a slap in the face too. I'd like an apology at the very least. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had one guy who said, well, your image shouldn't have been on Google. It was too easy to find. You should protect your work more. Like, okay, well, let's see what you like when Facebook takes it down. Yeah. And then he immediately blocks me, and then uh, he puts the image back up. And it's easy for me to see because uh, I can still see a little thumbnail uh, through our previous correspondence. So take down notice to Facebook, comes down, puts it back up immediately right afterwards. It, that happened seven or eight times. Um, and then I recorded all the Facebook numbers and everything, and um, the, the reference numbers, and said, Facebook, guys, Seriously, this isn't going to stop. This guy is damaging me. Uh, you have to either deactivate his account or do something more right. than just taking down the photograph. Um, and then it came down again, and I, it never came back up. So I don't know what they did specifically. Um, but yeah, this is a rampant thing. And yes. the general public, uh, artist or not, has very little respect for copyright. And that respect is constantly changing um, as we have more and more people that are on, on the losing end of this and are realizing, okay, you know what, I, I want to be respected, so I should respect everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I, 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 and I have the few cases I've had to do, I did it like you, I start off with trying to contact a person and be nice about it. Hey, you realize, you know, this is a copyrighted thing. If you want to use it, you need to buy it or get permission or something like that. And generally that I can get by with that. Um, but there have been cases where you got to do the takedown request. And, and for me, it's only been a handful. I know it's probably a constant problem for somebody like you who's very public with your and, and, and does a lot of great work. Well, in some cases, um, I send a takedown notice. In other cases, it's a commercial infringement, like yours yeah. was in Walmart. I enlist a lawyer for that purpose, and uh, I either get a settlement or I file a claim. And it sucks that that is a part of my business model. Um, but if they didn't license it for me to begin with, I'm going to get some licensing money somehow. Uh, and I will yeah, tell you what, I, one other thing where you can get caught up in this thing is, and this is where I, one of the ways I got caught up is I joined a local photo contest that our city held. I entered the contest and the contest, and I knew this, the contest gave the city the right to use that photo in, in promoting the city. However, individuals must have then taken that photo off of the contest and used it in their prints and other ways like that. And the, the, that, the con when I gave the city the right to use it, that wasn't transferable to everybody else. It was only for the city. But you, of have, course. To, but you have to look at those, those things when you enter a photo contest. Oh, and then a lot of them are written very draconianly. Yeah. Uh, there was a contest run by my city as well, and I read it, and basically they said anything submitted, whether or not the, that anybody wins anything from it, um, the city of Barrie owns uh, all rights to all submissions in perpetuity, worldwide, blah, blah, blah. You know, that kind of language. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was thinking, well, that if, if anybody actually read that, they would not submit their photo to this little small town uh, you know, contest. Right. And so I wrote to them and I said, guys, this language sucks. And I know you probably pulled this off of a template somehow. If you change these two paragraphs to be these two paragraphs, and I rewrote them for them, um, then you're not going to take anything more than you need. You've got everything that you need. The photographer keeps all of their rights. Um, you get the usage for just this contest, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they changed the rules for me. Oh, that's good. That's good. And then I entered the contest, and I won first place. <laughs> I actually stopped entering a contest because I could not get them to change the wording. 
Yeah, it's uh, it for me. I did that because that was a local contest. Um, mm -hmm. But if you just type in photo contest terms and conditions into Google, you'll find so many contests currently on right now. And you're going to land on the one page that you care about the most. Where and how do they take your rights? And then if it's agreeable to you, look at the rest of the contest. But start from the back end first. Yep. Yeah. Good discussion on that, Mike. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts? No, I mean, it's going to be a constant problem. That's just the the, the way people are today. They're going to continue to do it. And you got to still be active. I, I, I love that you're um, going after and, and, you know, defending your rights there because it's going to be a constant battle for the rest of your career. There. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's at some point, I will maybe even like hire somebody just like an intern just to start scouring the internet. It's really easy to find your infringements. Load up Google image search and uh, there's a little camera icon. That is the ability to upload a photo as a search term. So you can take some of your most popular photographs, upload them as a search term itself and uh, see where it shows up online. Some places you might not expect. You can do the same with Bing as well. TinEye is another service there yep. too. I've used that one. All right, story number three, moving right along. Uh, this one, uh, again, it's kind of ethereal in the sense that we're talking about patents that have been filed. Um, a number of patents for lenses and uh, gadgets and gizmos and internals to cameras have recently been unearthed, uh, filed by Canon. And two of them were interesting to me. I mean, the lens patents are always going to be lens patents. They've got a patent formula for that. But one of them was a hybrid viewfinder. And uh, this, I thought, was really fun. You could have a perfectly clear optical viewfinder that when the mirror flips up, it becomes a digital, uh, an electronic viewfinder. And this technology, I don't think, has existed in any way, shape, or form before, aside from possibly some uh, rudimentary overlays on top of the, um, uh, you know, where your focus points and things like that might exist but not having a full transition to a pure electronic viewfinder and then pressing a button and you're back to an optical path. Um, is this revolutionary, Mike, or is this something that I don't really care because it's too little too late? Um, it, it, to me, it sounds too little too late. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping not. Really, yeah. <laughs> I, it would bridge the, the, the gap here because I've used some of the early electronic viewfinders and I was really disappointed with them. Uh, and I've looked at some of the more modern ones and they've gotten incredibly better than they were. Yeah. But they still don't match the optical viewfinder, especially when you've got a lot of light. Or in some cases, um, especially even if you look at the Sony cameras, uh, their live view sucks at night. And so on my Canon cameras, I can typically find a bright star in the sky and focus on that when I'm doing astrophotography. All of my friends and colleagues that have Sony cameras, like the a7R2, can see nothing. Yeah. Uh, and they've got to use other ways to, uh, to find an infinity focus point. So if the electronic viewfinder is genuinely fantastic, and the optical viewfinder is there for people that uh, don't want to make the transition, this could be a bridge uh, that brings the... Uh, the majority of Canon shooters into a mirrorless world that is more acceptable to them, uh, that you know crosses off uh, all the little check boxes of what they want in a camera and making it smaller and lighter in the process. There's merit to it. But why was that not here five, six years ago? Yeah, because I think that the, you know, the electronic viewfinders are advancing pretty fast. By the time this is out there and in the market, it's just that market is shrinking, I think, that, that need this hybrid solution. I, well, if you look at the numbers, Canada is still rocking the sales. Uh, they are still number two in camera sales, uh, surpassed by Sony. But it, it, Olympus, Panasonic, Fuji, they're much lower, and they're all, all dealing with exclusively mirrorless products. So if you look at the, the volume of sales of cameras and lenses and just general equipment from Canon, it's... It's not to say that it's not shrinking. It probably is, but it is still such a big player in the industry uh, that it's it's dominating the majority of the mirrorless sales. Today, anyhow. I'm not saying that's going to be the same case in a few years. Yeah. Wait, Sony's dominating the mirrorless sales. So, oh, Sony's dominating all sales, really, yeah. right now. Uh, they're, they're, they've taken the industry by storm. In fact, um, I, I saw... 
recently somebody had taken apart an older Canon Rebel camera. Um, Giga Macro had done it, uh, and they did a, a, a gigapixel macro image of all the parts of this camera. And I couldn't help but notice that the LCD screen on that camera was made by Sony as well. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no matter what you buy, you're getting Sony. Right, yeah. A lot of Nikon uh, sensors are Sony. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe not all of them. There's rumors that the, the latest one in the D850 is from a new upstart company. Um, but uh, that is still yet to be confirmed. Maybe we'll talk about that on a future episode. Um, but there was another fun patent to, to end off on that uh, I thought, oh, well, that's great. That would be so great to have that in my cameras. I can't believe it's taken that long to get here. And that was to have uh, illuminated buttons on the back of the camera. And I'm thinking, oh, the industry is going to love this. Canon's first yeah. to the market. And then I just go and I look online to see, wow, surely nobody else has done this before. Come on. <laughs> and everybody else has done yes. that. The only my one that doesn't do it is Canon. <laughs> my Nikon D500 does that. Yeah. So yeah. Well, good on you, Canon, for patenting something that I don't know, maybe they found a different way to do it so that they wouldn't have to license it from whoever owns that patent. But um, it's just, it, a lot of that feels a little bit too late. I mean, you you can take amazing photographs with an amazing Canon camera, but yeah. I still don't have an internal intervalometer. Uh, I don't have uh, illuminated buttons on the back. Uh, you know, of course, you know, this hybrid viewfinder would be nice to have. But there's a lot of little things that we're missing. I spent some time with the Panasonic GH5 earlier this year, and I was blown away by the feature set built into that camera and how easy it was to navigate around the menus. I would say second only to Canon, Nikon. Mike, I'm sorry, Nikon's menus are awful. They're yeah. an inconsistent wonder, from one camera to the next. You know, obviously these guys all know what everybody else makes. And I wonder if the reason what's holding them back for why hasn't Canon done this before is like you said, it's the, the patent that, that, you know, whoever did it first has a patent and now they're charging. You got to buy a, pay a license to put it on your camera and maybe Canon won't pay for that license and had to do it on their own and, and develop a different way. And that's I can, all I can those guarantee little, you this is it. Yeah, all uh, those little nitpicky things. Why, why doesn't somebody take all the best of every camera and stick it on one camera? And the thing that limits all that is a lot of times is the patents. Or taxes. Uh, you know, there's a reason why your camera can only shoot 29 minutes and 59 seconds of video before it cuts off. Uh, because if it shoots more than that, it gets taxed as both a camcorder and a still camera at the same time. And so they put that limit in there to prevent the tariffs from limiting the manufacturer's profits. Isn't that just insane? Yeah. Yeah, it's the world we live in, man. Yeah. <laughs> the but, uh, consequences of those things. Yeah, and you know, we have to just live through it. And uh, you know, I've done a lot of documentary filmmaking, and uh, this past year, I did some shooting for National Geographic, and they were getting me to do time lapse of flowers. And when I started doing some of that on video, I was able to get some clips of uh, crocuses opening and flowers that would you could get cold and then heat up, and then they would uh, dramatically react. Uh, and I'd get a response within thirty minutes, but I'd always go back to the camera and sit beside it for the last five minutes or so mm -hmm. to see if I had to stop it and start it again uh, to, to create a new clip to overcome the darn tax problem. And, you know, I would be willing to pay a fee to have that feature unlocked if I ever needed it on that camera, but to not burden everybody with it. But that's yeah. far more complicated uh, than I think you know, we have the pay grade to, uh, to assess and properly find a solution for. Yeah, we're, we're, we don't have a good lobbyist uh, to, to help us out with that. Exactly, exactly. Well, Mike, these have been some fun stories. Uh, was there yeah, any takeaways for you that uh, that kind of uh, struck a chord? Uh, you know, the Hasselblad um, story that you had, the, the first one that you had there, it's, you know, as I'm looking to get more and more in the landscape, I'm looking at the Nikon 850, which, you know, is is a little bit cheaper than that, that Hasselblad, but I would love to someday rent one. I've never shot medium format, and for me, it's always been completely out of my price range. It was, it was, I can't dream of ever having one of those, and now they're getting cheaper and cheaper, and the ability to rent one for a reasonable price is something that may be fun to do, even if I don't intend buying one, just fun to, to shoot with for a little bit. And then, you know, you'll need to buy a better computer to process those 50 Absolutely. or 100 megapixel files, right? So that's the perfect <laughs> excuse. <laughs> that or just go to sleep and come back the next day. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Mike, what uh, what projects do you have on the go right now? We are coming every year in December. And you've been you've helped us out with this before. We uh, do a, a photo contest on our in our group. So uh, your group is JPEG to RAW, by the JPEG. way. I don't think we mentioned that at all. We did not JPEG to RAW, and it's not about converting JPEGs into RAW. <laughs> um, but yeah, we do a, an annual thing there, and we are getting geared up to do that again this year. That's my main project going on there um, with with that. Photography wise, you, you know, I'm coming off the sports season here and looking to do something for the winter. I hadn't decided what I'm going to do for the winter as winter sets in here in South Georgia or North Georgia. Well, uh, get yourself a good macro lens and maybe you'll get some cold weather and can enjoy freezing soap bubbles and snowflakes and, and the ilk. Oh, yeah. I, Annette, you, you were on our show for the macro and some other shows. I think you've been on four times. And that is still to this day one of the our, one of our top performers and people just love that show and get so much value out of what you taught us in that show i i think i'm uh i'm number two next to boudoir if i'm not mistaken yes so you know i don't that, think anybody could take that crown <laughs> from that so there you go yep so i get some flack from that you know that we uh, about the boudoir show but i say hey a number two is a macro show and at you're high up on the, another one of your shows is high up there, too. I don't think you'll ever overtake the Boudoir show, but um, yes. Well, the maybe macro. we could funnel all of the Photo Geek Weekly audience to go and view that. Uh, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And uh, maybe, little bit by little bit, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, where, can we, uh, where, where can we find uh, your uh, happenings through uh, JPEG to Raw and uh, any other work that you want to show off? Uh, best place is jpeg to rawcom That's, you know, all my links are over there. Now, do you spell it with an E or without? With an E, but I own both, so both will get you there. Perfect. And it's not the number two. JPEG, the number two, raw. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Mike. It was great to have you in, uh, in the co-pilot seat. And uh, maybe we'll have you back on if you enjoyed this. Uh, and yeah. if... Uh, if anybody listening or watching this enjoyed having Mike on board, uh, then that's great. We were supposed to have uh, Alan Shapiro here, but uh, he's out sick, and he'll be coming in in December. And next up is, uh, who do I have scheduled for next? Um, Alan Atridge, uh, who is on the Two Hosers Photo Show. And uh, I think that'll be a fun chat. We'll try to find some video topics for him to talk about because he's, uh, he's a professional videographer as well as all of the photo stuff. So thanks, everybody, for listening. If you enjoy this content, uh, go over to Photo Geek Weekly, and there is a Patreon support. And uh, every little bit we can get, every dollar here and there, uh, keeps me caffeinated while we record these things and awake while I have a 17-month-old daughter that uh, is draining most of my energy at this point. There's also a little tip jar and uh, a contact form. If you enjoy this, reach out. Tell me what you think, good, bad, and ugly, because we want to make this better over time in every possible way, including any stories that you might think are good to be covered here. So with all of that said, well, get out and shoot. <laughs>